Okay, let's get started with the session, uh, session one. We will continue with our main topic. So do we need more translator or do we need more um, <coughs> bilinguals? So first of all, we might wonder what is the global point, global turning point. The first is the world economy is out of balance. In another word, that there is some, there is the central gravity of economic power is shifting to the, from the United States to Asia. So this is the demography change. So let's get started here. There is a rising international business contact. So emerging market multinationals are expanding around the world. And for example, in 2010, uh, the emerging multinationals, they represent 25% of largest 500 companies in the world. That means the central, the central gravity of global economic power is moving from the US or the Europe to the emerging countries, especially the China. So that means there is a growing need for the rising contact uh, from the, among the people from different countries will create the demand. Do we demand for a common language or demand for a translator? This is the question that David Christa, he introduced in his book, The English as a Global Language. Here the discussion question is Korean case. The so Korea, the Korea is famous for spending a lot of money in speaking, in learning the English. And should we continue to spend billions of dollars in learning English? Or should we continue to depend on human translators for international contact? These are the questions that we are going to discuss. That's why we divide our class in the eight teams. So each team is supposed to present your opinion. So what is your position? Do you think that we need more translator or do we need more bilinguals? So um, before you, I'd like to invite each team come over here and present your point, your story. Why, if you think you need more translator, <clears throat> why do you think so? Before you are doing this, I'm going to give some tips. I'm going to give some stories. So the first story <clears throat> is about, about, as you see, that we need more bilinguals because <clears throat> this is a story about Irish writers. The Irish people, they have a Gaelic <coughs> as their uh, mother tongue. So the Irish people, they have ambivalence. <coughs> ambivalent. They have ambivalent attitude toward the English language. In another word, they love it, they hate it. So th this is the dilemma the Irish authors like James Joyce and Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, they, they are very internationally famous authors. This was the dilemma. Should we write our books in Gaelic or should we write our books in English? Then their choice was to write in English. That it was described as escape. <coughs> Bernard Shaw escaped from, escape from escape from their mother tongue. Why? Why they chose to write in English even though they really wanted to write it in their mother tongue, the Gaelic? Why? Because they need to reach a global fan. If you had written in Gaelic, they, they should have remained, they could have remained as a local author and uh, nobody in other countries would recognize their, their genius. The talent could have been buried in, in the in Irish. So, because they chose to write their books in, in uh, English, that was an instrument for them to gain a global status as an author. This is the first case in support of we need more bilinguals. And the second story in support of we need more bilinguals is the Chinese. 
As you know, the Chinese is the biggest population in the world. About, hmm? And the, the linguistics, they estimate that there are about 500 million people, Chinese, they are learning English. So why they are learning English? Even though their English is a little bit different from standard English, they call the Chinglish. So the Chinese, why they are learning oh, the English? Because they are economically strong. They are very economically strong. That means that they need to have more business with America or the West. So English is a means for Chinese to have an access to the US-led economic power. Then we have another story about the English, English is still at the hand of English. This, I have already explained it. English, the fate of English is no longer at the hand of native speakers. They are moving toward just expanding circles. So that means English will continue to change. The word will be influenced by the foreign speakers and the grammar will be reshaped by the foreign speakers and English is continued to shape. As you know, the language is a democratic language. You can, every, every, you can add it, you can play with it, you can ignore some part of it. So this is some example stories in support of we need more bilinguals. And on, on, on the other hand, we have another three stories that support we need more translators. The first story is that let me take you to the <coughs> It's about, no, it's about a century. There was, um, there was Thomas Macquarie. He used to be a governor, the governor counselor in India. Then he, um, he found that there was a pr communication barrier between the British ruler, British politicians, and uh, the Indian people. So he, he thought that we need to cultivate a group of Indian translators who can serve as a communicator between British rulers and the Indian people. So that's why he scouted a certain group of Indian people that was smart. Then he brought them to India and he brought them to London and they taught them and they taught English. They, they taught them not only English, but also the <coughs> British culture, so that the Indian people, they can speak in the way the British speak, and, the fight, and the, they, can, they can have some opinions. They have British opinions, and British fashion, and British way of lifestyle. So this elite group of Indian interpreters, they served as a bridge between the British rulers and Indian grassroots. And we have another story, the India, native Indians. As you know, the, <coughs> the Puritan, so there is the first Puritan people, they landed in America in 16, 1620. So they came from England and they first arrived in the amazing new land of America. Everything was strange. Everything was different. So maybe half, more than half of them, they died after one year after they landed it because they can't adapt themselves to the new life. Then there was the Indian, the native Indians, they came along, they came as an interpreter. So it's a mystery of how the native Indians, they could speak English. But anyway, they spoke very good English. And the native, uh, the native Indian, they taught them how to catch fish, uh, how to grow corns. And they, uh, they even negoti helped negotiate the peace treaty with the Indians. In other, in other words, the native Indian interpreters, they were helper for the Puritan people, the colonists. They, just, they could survive. The Puritan people, they could survive thanks to the help of native English interpreters. So native English interpreters were essential 
for the Puritan colonists to survive in this new world of America. So in this way, the interpreters could be a very help, helpful. So we have another story in support, in support of, uh, in support of uh, um, uh, argument that we need more translator. Have you heard about the vegetarian in Korean novel? The Korean uh, novelist, she wrote this uh, So at the time, she actually was published 10 years ago, but it was not popular. It was just remained as, uh, as if it were nothing for 10 years. Then Deborah Smith, a British uh, translator, she started learning Korean 10 years ago. I mean, uh, he started learning Korean in 2010. So he had to study the Korean language for six years. Then he happened to read the Han Gang's novel, Vegetarian, and she liked it. So she, did, she wanted to translate it. So she contacted the Han Gang and publisher. They finally got the right license to translate it. And she translated Deborah Smith, the British a uh, 26-year-old uh, student, he translated the Korean novel. Then it was picked up by the Western publishers, Membuka. 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 I don't know if he's speaking. Anyway, the Membuka. So this, uh, the vegetarian, he was, uh, was awarded with the top novel by the Membuka, <coughs> Membuka publishers. This is meaningful because the member co members, they are publishers. So the publishers know which book sells. They have some business sense. I would say this, is, uh, this book has a literary virtue, but the member co members, they are publishers, American publishers and European publishers, they have some business acumen that this book will sell. In other words, the vegetarian will be favorite book by French people, German people, and American people, they would like it. So this is the benefit of the translation works. If Deborah Smith does not translate the vegetarian, the vegetarian would have remained anonymous. Nobody, no global, it could have no global fans in America, Europe. So this is because of the translator, Deborah Smith, that the vegetarian Korean novel could rise as recognized as a very good book. So this is uh, another case. And also, <coughs> we have another story, uh, story in support of our argument we need more translator, the education. As you know, the translation used, used as a classroom. As you were a high school student, you remember that we used to, you, we used to learn English through translation, 그죠? 중고등학교 때 번역하면서 영어 배웠잖아. But nowadays in English, in university, then everybody say, or many universities say, we don't need uh, Korean language, so we need more English only class. This is the English only class. But actually, personally, I would say that translation should be an essential part of English education. Why? Because in translation is a not, no longer old-fashioned grammar study. We can develop a lot of, a lot of method by using translation in order to learn English. So this class is one example. So the, in the since the 1980s, there are many teachers, they have developed, they thought, is there any way, is there any better way? By using translation, we can also learn English efficient, efficiently. The example is the collectivism. Social collectivism. This is uh, one principle of edu uh, education or many other fields. That means the education should be something unique, something individual, 
for each student. So if you are lecturing, then everybody sits still, you just listen, but don't worry. The next time, you should speak, and you should talk to your friends, and you should discuss, and you should think. My job is not to talk. My job is to let you think. My job is to let you speak. My job is to discuss with your friends. And every process of learning English should be the process of individual students to think. And every, every the learning experience should be something unique and individual. So, so a translation can be used for, uh, so the learning should be a series of story, cases, and theory, and the student participation. This is the way that I divided our class into story and the theory and the, your uh, student activities. Yeah, that's it. I, this is uh, example stories that they can use in support of we need more translators or we need more bilinguals. So this wraps up my, uh, this is the mini, uh, so I'd like to take a break of just a 10 minutes so that you have, look around, you have four members here, so I will give 10 minutes. This is uh, breaking ice time. Please introduce yourself to your friends and get to know each session. After 10 minutes later, then we will start the discussion. Okay, have fun. Talk to your friends. Now, I'm going to talk to your friends. So, as you know, we are shooting our class, but uh, if, you, if it is okay for you to show yourself and your voice or your uh, faces and your contents uh, to be shown in our class, then you could write it down, your department, your number and the name and the lecture and the sign. If you agree to show your faces in our class, our class will be open to the internet. Maybe it will be available six months later. If you think it's okay, you can show it, then you can sign it. But if you do not agree, it's okay, you can pass it. Then if you present your, um, if you okay, if you agree, then if you present your speech, then you will be shown on our video, class video. But if you do not want that, uh, you, you can edit. Your appearance will be um, cut off. 그렇죠? 만약에 원하지 않으면 자르면 되죠. 편집할 때 어, 자르면 돼요. So um, anyway, so I will uh, let you have, and it will go around you. Please sign it. And um, 자. <coughs> so anyway, so there must be reason that why we need why we need the speech. Why? Because interpreter, it should be a good speaker. So interpreter is, in a sense, it should be a copycat actor of the person for which you are interpreting. For example, the person for which you are interpreting is charismatic, then you should be a copycat of charismatic. That means you should be very flexible according to the character, different character of the speaker. If the speaker is modest and low profile, you should be also copycat of low profile and modest. And if one speaker is very passionate and vigorous speaker, then you should be also copycat of very vigorous and mm, very passionate uh, interpreter. So that's why we are giving you, and this is a chance. I don't care that much about what you say. I will care about how you say. So you need some kind of a poise, presence, speaker. You should be a speaker, good interpreter. So this is why I'd like to invite any team member come over here and just to present the story. Don't care that much about your story. I'm interested in the delivery, the frame of your speech. Like a courage, let's practice together. 자, 연습하는 시간이니까 자, time is getting closer. We will start. 5분에 시작합니다. 자, would you, are you ready? Please select one leader and write down your name. Then uh, we will see. Mm. Excuse me, while we are taking courage, and I will talk about translation theory a little bit, then uh, let me know when you are ready. <laughs> so, <clears throat> 
Mm. What is translation? Translations are different things for different group of people. For example, for translators, translation is a activity. Translation is a process of translation. What is the translation for translator? It is something about receiving the request from the client. And we, when you start, it's about the research, about the related topic. And also translator is how to find your friend if you need some help. And also translator is something about the, the locating the informa information. And translator is also computer work. You must find out how to locate the necessary data and the sources. And translator also should be flexible enough to request uh, to respond to the client request. And the translator should be also communicator. On translator also should be negotiating, negotiator for the price, price of their work. And the translator is also networking of other translators. Sometimes they need some help. So for translators, interpreters, it is an activity. So when they receive the request for the translation or interpretation, the first thing they think about how to translate it and why I should translate it, then how can I translate it? Actually, when I used to be a translator, at the time, sometimes I, used, I had to translate technical report. <clears throat> this is about the IT business. That should be very accurate. <coughs> source test. So the clients expect me to be faithful to the source test. They don't want to be creative. They don't want to be imaginative. They don't want to be rhetoric. What they want is accuracy to the source test. Sometimes I uh, advertising. Sometimes I, uh, I had to translate advertising lines and the client want, to, want me to find out tagline. So if there is some messages, <clears throat> they give me a lot of data about the company activities and product and history. They want me to get the tagline. <clears throat> the tagline should be compelling and they should be tangible. So this is kind of we should go to closer to the target language effect, target oriented, target language oriented. Sometimes uh, I advertise this, the annual report <coughs> of the companies. So they, do, they want to become between somewhere like this. They want to be somewhere out of fluent and they want to be my translation to be balanced, balanced on the scale between the accuracy of the source text and the effects of the target language. So I, um, I once tried to translate a novel here. Novel, in this case, that will be more, that will be very difficult to find out what should be the novel. I would say it should go where it's somewhere between novel. And uh, I found that Deborah Smith, Deborah Smith, she tend to be closer to the target language. That's why the, the American leaders, they say he, her translation reads so fluent. It doesn't sound like Korean text. So Deborah, Deborah Smith's way of translating the vegetarian is more going closer to the Western reader, Western readers, so that they don't have to be painfully uh, literal. Here we have a literal translation. That means that is the closest to the source text. But the Deborah, uh, Deborah Smith's translation of vegetarian was not literal. She was more, she was trying to 
make his translation to the text to sound very fluent and very effective to the, the Americans and the Europeans. So sometimes you, so you, so you can see it all depends on the scopus, scopus, the purpose of a translation, then the, the level of a fidelity, the level of accuracy vary. It depends on the purpose of your translation. So it depends on the demand from your client. Sometimes the clients ask you, I would like you to be as accurate as to the, to the source text, if, if that is a technical report. But sometimes, you know, the subtitle, movie subtitle. The movie subtitle, you see, in this case, the movie subtitle has a space limit, that has a time limit. So in this case, the movie subtitle, when you translate the movie subtitles, that should be close, as close to the target language. You cannot translate the movie, uh, movie subtitles by going closer to the source text. It would sound very far, foreign, it would sound very painful for the target audiences. So it depends. So the level of accuracy is different depending on the text, depending on the purpose of the translation. So this is the way the translators or interpreters, they see the translation, their job. This is the job. They should negotiate a reasonable price. They should, sometimes they should mobilize their network of friends. So there is one benefit of studying at the graduate school interpretation that I have a network of my friends. I know who is doing good well in the legal test. I know who is doing good well in the subtitle. I know who is doing good well in the technical report. So sometimes if uh, I used to be a translator, then I got a uh, text that I cannot do that, and I ask her to do on my behalf. So this is a way of a network of friends. And also, you should be very competent in the computation, computer works. There is a lot of data stored in English that you can use it. Then, how about the client? How about the readers? They are not interested in how we translate it. The only thing they are interested in is the text. The only thing is the text. Therefore, for them, the outsiders, that the translation is just a product. It's a commodity. So they want to rely on the text. So that is text reliability. So the clients, the readers, they want to rely on the translated text so that they can serve as a basis of their decision or action. So text to rely, and also reliability in broader sense also, the clients want to trust you. For example, they can, you, you should keep the deadline. Deadline is very important. And also the clients want you to translate or interpret as soon as possible, as rapidly as possible. This is a very time sensitive job. So that's why we sometimes are complaining. Translators, they are complaining. That the, uh, you know, the, especially the government officials, they usually come to, so this is translation. Please do it tomorrow. Please do it one week later. Then we would say, we translators are not coffee machine. Huh? We are not the coffee machine. So we need more time. But the clients, they want to, the translator to be fast translator. And also they want to translator to be, um, to translate reliable, reliable. And also they want to translate it cheaply. The clients, are they, they don't want to spend a lot of money on translator. So that's why the translator, they should be very good negotiator with the, uh, their clients. So, this is the difference.
between the way the translators they are looking at the you know, the, the translation and the outsiders like readers, then it's like a, let's compare it with a carpenter. Carpenter, if they want to make a desk, it, the first thing is how to make it, how to design it, uh, how to make it useful for my clients. So, is there any help? Is there any information that I need to make it beautiful? This is the thing that carpenter would think about this part. But how about the consumers? Consumers, they never mind how they made it. They just see it as a product, as a final product, as a commodity. And what they want is to just rapidly made it, and reliably made it, and cheaply made it. Just the price. So this is, uh, so this is the difference. So, but nowadays, up to now, the, the, how about the translation theory? Translation theory has this usually focus on the way the clients are looking at it. In another word, translation theory is mostly about text reliability. Text reliability. In another word, they were more interested in looking at the translation as the final product. So that's why they always talking. They usually talking about text reliability. So, the next class we are talking about the, what are the types of text reliability. There are several types of text reliability. So we are putting it on the scale list here. Putting it on the scale. So, so how we should. So we have some choices, we have some choices. There are several types of text reliability. So um, this is the next class, this is the topic. Okay, that wraps up our session two. So if you need more information, if you need more, want to know more detail, I have uploaded our class materials on our class site, so you can read it. Grigo, huh? anyway, so any, any more team leader? Are you ready to speak? Because, because of a translator, that all the other professionals, so they can be more strategic. They can be focused on what is more important to their job. They don't have to waste a lot of time and money in learning English. So, oh no, so another point is very good. So the translator, they are linguistic expert. They can uh, make it English even better, and they can find a better way of expression and uh, so linguistically very beautiful and competent language. So for language itself, the translators would be better. Very good. So, uh, so uh, let's uh, wrap up this session. Let's, like, uh, let's take a five-minute break. Then after the break, then we will start the session three that we have a two text for us read and recall. So this is about the issue that we still need interpretation. Uh, because nowadays, English, <coughs> that English is the common language in many uh, international conferences. But there is a question on the need of learning English. Why? Because there are many more and more bilinguals. So many people begin to doubt. We still need interpreters. So this is the question that comes from many of the applicants for the graduate school of interpretation. So even if we study here, do we have any future as an interpreter? They don't need more interpreters. Because especially young people, they can speak English. Why we need English interpreter? This is the question. So is it really true? <coughs> and also another question is machine, automatic machine. There is a lot of automatic machine. Therefore, the question is whether machine can replace human interpreters. This is the question. And especially <coughs> nowadays, one other issue is everybody, especially in Korea, they, they are talking about the importance of learning English and the education of a mother tongue, education of a Korean. They seem to be a little bit uh, taken aback. Set. In another word, the people are now less and less 
aware of the importance of learning our mother tongue. But as you know, interpreters should be perfectly bilingual. So you, if you, a good interpreter has a good balance between his mother tongue ability and the English ability. There should be a balance. But then the education has tilted toward the English. So this is the problem. So if you only, so uh, for example, the mothers, they are trying to let their babies or kids to learn only English. I would say personally that was the best way to kill their baby's ability to be perfectly bilingual. So anyway, so do you agree that the machines, automatic machine, will eventually replace human translators? So that means there is no future for the future of career of interpreters. This is the, this text imposes the question to the reader. And this is the text, uh, uh, this is the exam text of the Hangul Wede Tongyok Bonyok Dehagon Shiamunje. So, um, <clears throat> I'd like to invite any volunteer students come over here. You should be Korean and read it, this one, while the other students attentively read together the Korean text. Any volunteer to read the Korean text? Just a two or two minutes speech should be enough, in Korean or in English. So um, uh, I'd like to expect the paraphrase. So please remember, translator job is understand the message and analyze it and restructure it. Anybody? Actually, I'd like to uh, let you know, I'd like to uh, announce that you have uh, some assignment, home assignment for the next week. So far, we have two texts. One is, next class, we did Basker and Basker. That was English. So I'd like you to paraphrase in English. What are the major points? And you can write it again in English sentences. So it should be uh, just a two thirds of it or uh, one half of the original text. The length of your paraphrase should be one half of the original text or two thirds of the original text. A paraphrase it. Please remember when you paraphrase it, you, you are not writing as, as the original text. I'd like to express it. To write it in your own uh, way. The paraphrase means get the message and write it in your own expression. This is a very important part of skill, translator skill. We need to practice. So we have two choices. One is Basque and Basque. You can paraphrase it from English to English. And another choice is today's text, Tongyok <coughs> Yongsang, the usefulness of interpretation. Then uh, uh, you have two choices. One is just to paraphrase it from Korean to Korean. Or you can paraphrase it, you can translate Korean to English. So international students, you have a choice to Basque and Basque. Korean students have two choices. One is Basque and Basque and the other is the usefulness of interpretation. I just take one and please write it down and please submit it on our class, on our class site. Next week's assignment. Good job. Anyway, anybody is ready. So you can speak in Korean or you can speak in English. So whether the translation is useful and the job will survive, will continue, is there any future for the interpreters? So the automatic machine will replace the human translators. Actually, David Crystal said the machine translator will be a challenge because its accuracy it will be more and more accurate. And it will be faster and faster. The machine uh, translation will become faster and faster and more accurate. However, that will not happen in our generation, he said. <laughs> it will be happen maybe 100 years later, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> anyway, that's his opinion. So <clears throat> I'd like to invite you, any student, what is the message? 
please remember, this is different. So if you read this text, maybe you have a different opinion, but interpreters does not have their opinion. Interpreters and translators, they do not have their opinion. They just understand the text, and their job is to translate the text. Even if you regard, I don't like this text, I don't agree with text, it's not your translator's job to change it. So that's the difference between speaker and translator. Sometimes you don't agree with a text that for which you should translate, but you, are not, you should not be judgmental. You are not judge the argument. You just, your job is just to understand it, translate it. That is the job of interpretation. It's a translator, they cannot express their your own opinion. Uh, that's why the translator is a capicot, capicat, and their job is to just to translate as it is said, as it is written. Translator should not be judgmental. They cannot decide the quality of the text. Your job is to just to talk as they intend. Your job is to deliver the message as spoken. Uh, your job is not editor. Your job is not editor. You cannot change the message. Uh, it should be accurate interpretation of the message. That's important. So anyway, anybody is ready to be there? What is the main message of this text? Maybe you need more time? Because hmm? uh, yeah, maybe it's maybe too fast. Uh, so I will give you more time. Maybe uh, next class that I expect you, if you write it, and if you spend more time to analyze, and you, uh, you wrote it down, then you'll be ready to announce. So maybe today also. Then um, we have still time. So I'd like to <coughs> move to the third topic. English text. <coughs> uh, the topic is about ghost. <coughs> ghost, you <coughs> don't. Do you think? Uh, <coughs> do you think the ghost exists? Some people believe there are ghosts. Other people don't believe that there is no ghost. So the message is, it's a matter of perception. If you believe there are ghosts, there are ghosts. If you do not believe there are ghosts, there is no ghost. So if you believe there is a ghost, it will exist anyway. If you doubt you, if you doubt it, so you will not believe there is no ghost, no matter how hard you try to persuade it. So this is about this one. So there are many physical, mm -hmm. logical way to uh, persuade that there are no ghosts. And, <clears throat> but the believers would eventually, the, um, there are many ghost encounters. They are arguing that there are ghosts, but some people say, no, there is no ghost. This is a, not a simple effect of noise, light, and the noise and the light and the fog of mist. This is the main message. So I'd like to invite one student to read it, this text, English text. So this is the way, the Hangul way, the Tongbonyok Deagwan. The English teacher read it in 90 minutes speech. Then they have time, then uh, Korean students, they are supposed to reproduce it and maybe in one hour, and one maybe and 40, 40. So the time is just half of it. So you just get the main gist of it. But I don't think we should, we should do that. Why? Because they are testing as the result of intensively studying interpretation in Hagwon for one or two years. But the reason that I'm trying to introduce the test is just to feel the test. This is what they are doing. So uh, uh, what I'm expecting is that they don't try to be stressful. So I should do that. 
No, you don't. You don't have to do that. Uh, this is not the class to stress you out. This is the class to make you interested in. Oh, you just have fun. But I don't want to be too relaxed. Uh, a little bit tension is necessary. That's why I'm giving you home assignment. 그죠? 그러니까 um, you have a choice, Korean or English, and uh, just make it half or a third of it. That will be enough. Just to practice. Uh, don't expect too much from the beginning. It should be a step-by-step -step basis. I know you have all of you, most of you have some potential. So I know that my job is just to tap it. Oh, just to tap it. So uh, <clears throat> just uh, that's why I'm giving a short home assignment. Just uh, as you uh, next class, so I expect you. Uh, I expect at least the five or six, six students to come over here and present in one or two minute English speech about, it could be about Basker and Basker, it could be about Tong Yogi Yuyong Song, or it could be, and next class the topic will be discussed. And this will be the uh, text for the next class, session three. And the final note is, please come to our class site and take a look at the most of the class material. As you know, we have no uh, class text. Instead, I have uh, half a dozen references here Then I extracted from these books. So that's why you should uh, uh, follow closely. You should visit our class materials uh, before and after the class. Hmm? Any question? Okay. Uh, let's uh, call it a day and have a nice day.